All right, we're going to continue on with uh, the physical principles of computed tomography. Uh, so we'll pick up where we left off on the last lecture. Uh, the, the slides are repeated at the end of the last lecture's file, but I've put them on as a separate lecture on the website. Uh, so just to get right into the heart of the matter, the data that we're going to obtain with a CT scanner, at least in two dimensions, is diagrammed here in which you have projections through a patient. And these projections are along parallel lines. And along each one of these parallel lines, we look at the absorption of the x-rays along that line. Uh, you'll notice that if we do this along parallel lines, this is not the geometry of a modern CT scanner. And we talked about that last time which is a fan beam. So those rays have to be rebinned or restructured such that we put all of the parallel rays together. They, they will be achieved in different views, all of the parallel rays that I've shown in this diagram, but you can bin those views such that they are uh, parallel or interpolate the data to, to create parallel views. So if we look at one ray here, and we assume we have an intensity of x-rays hitting the patient here, an intensity of x-rays that have been detected uh, on our detector here, uh, the loss of x-rays is governed by uh, this equation, in which we have an exponential decay with a linear coefficient here. And um, this is proportional to essentially the electron density of the material at that position S along this line. So if there's bone here in a rib, mu will be very high, will we'll actually attenuate a lot of x-rays. If it's air, mu will be very low, and we won't attenuate x-rays. In order to gather up the projection data to create a picture, and the picture will be, the brightness of a pixel in this picture will be proportional to this value mu. Uh, we transform the detected data, which is this number of x-rays detected at each uh, detector on our array, and we normalize that number to the incident number, take the negative log, and then we have a positive number which is proportional to the amount of attenuation. So high attenuation gives us a high positive number. We cannot have a negative number in this data. It's all positive numbers. And the higher the number, the more the attenuation. Interestingly, as the number of photons or x-rays that are detected at any one detector gets lower and lower and lower, the uncertainty in the true value of, of that number actually gets wider. Our uncertainty gets worse or bigger as the number gets lower and or the relative uncertainty. Uh, so ironically the brighter the pixel in the image the higher the noise on that pixel or the higher the uncertainty. So if you get really bright stuff in a picture they you know the levels at that point will will be will have a higher noise value than uh, values that have low Hounsfield units are low numbers in the picture. Remember, there's about a thousand detectors along in this one dimension here. Uh, we'll click through a certain number of angles. And essentially, the number there is you want about the same number of angles as you have uh, detector points along here, roughly. So we'll go through about a thousand angles, actually, about 800. Uh, on most modern scanners in order to uh, essentially solve for a pixel with a resolution that's about half a millimeter by half a millimeter. Uh, our raw data looks like this, and it's a two-dimensional function, a function of L along the detector and a function of theta for each different view, and we're going to invert or solve for the underlying mu x y uh, field uh, given this data. And this is what we understand and what we can see in, as, as a uh, person. 
So just to review from last lecture, this is what modern two-dimensional CT data looks like at different angles theta. This is the Z direction, usually or the slice direction. Most scanners now have at least 64 slices in that direction. Uh, and they go up to 320 on the, on the Toshiba scanner. Uh, in this direction, this is the L direction on that last diagram. And there's about a thousand detectors in that direction. Okay? So the field of view is not square, it's a, it's a rectangle. Um, for all of the math that we're going to look at for reconstruction of CT images, we're going to look at two-dimensional reconstruction. And so what we'll do is we'll take out one row of this data, just a single row, not the whole data here, not the, you know, the two-dimensional picture. We'll take out one constant row of that picture. And at the center of the scanner, in a modern scanner, that constant row is essentially a flat plane. Obviously, as we move away from the center of the scanner, you know from the geometry of the x-rays that there's an angle between the source and this uh, row of detectors. So it, it t there's a tilt to that, which makes things complicated. We're not going to discuss that complication. In order to do that, you need to do a whole three-dimensional Feldkamp inversion process, right? So we're, the math of that gets really messy. It's not that, yes, it is hard and messy. Okay, so we're not gonna talk about it. What we're gonna talk about is, let's assume we need to reconstruct this slice, which is right through the center of our data, and all of those x-rays are coming down in a plane from the source. Okay? We will rebin those x-rays such that we can create data sets using parallel uh, beams of, of x-rays. Here's our parameterization of our data. G is the the, num, you know, the brightness or the amount of attenuation. It's proportional to L. This is the L direction. This is the Z direction. And you can see the theta is clicking around. We'll set Z, let's say, to zero so that we're along here for the rest of this. When we look <clears throat> at the data, the two-dimensional data that's achieved uh, using this, we, we can see a, a picture like this. So let's suppose this is in that center slice that we were talking about. Our source for one you know, projection would come through like this. And um, this would be the L direction as we're detecting. And uh, the Z direction is a, is a fixed slice. And we get about 800 thetas uh, or views of, of this plane. So in two dimensions, this is usually x and y uh, in this direction, and z is through the plane. Okay, any questions about the geometry uh, that we're reconstructing? So as you, as you can see from this data, there, it's a three-dimensional data set. We're not going to talk about how to reconstruct it in three dimensions. We're just going to assume that we have a set of parallel slices. Right? So inside each one of those parallel slices, here's our, our geometry. And that, let's take a very simple example. Okay, we'll look at a disk that's in the XY plane in the scanner. And so we'll say around this disk is air, and then inside the disk we'll say we have water. Okay. Uh, as the X-rays hit the object, they they don't uh, they are not attenuated much by the air. As they move through this uniform object, they're attenuated with a rate governed by the linear attenuation coefficient of that substance. And then when they emerge uh, from the other side and hit the detector, they're down here. So there'll be a, a certain number that have been attenuated. For this view, from if, if we assume our x-rays are coming down vertically like this, um, obviously the number of x-rays that are attenuated is proportional to the distance that we travel through the object, right? And so when we look at our, the G function, 
um, it's essentially just proportional to the amount of stuff if the stuff is is uniform and so it's just the uh, you, all you have to do is calculate the length of that line and that gives you the relative number of uh, x-rays that have been absorbed okay so the projection of this disk is a function that looks like this and you can calculate that in this very simple example because it's a uniform object just by integrating the, the boundary you know from one boundary to the other boundary so I have an equation for this boundary here, an equation for this boundary here, and I can integrate between those two limits to get the amount of attenuation that's going to occur, the relative amount of attenuation. Okay? And so the projection of a disk is this function. And then we can write it down analytically in this case because we had an analytical integral we could solve, and it's this function. Okay? It is not a semicircle. It's this function. So the other feature that we need to discuss or compensate for is the fact that when x-rays come out of an x-ray tube, they don't all come out with exactly the same energy. So the wavelength of the x-rays that are emerging from the tube, uh, there's a spectrum of those wavelengths or a spectrum of energies. Um, much like a light bulb, when you shine a light bulb, the, you know, there's blue and yellow and the whole rainbow is coming out of that white light bulb, right? In the same way, an x-ray bulb has a, a spectrum of energies. The highest x-ray energy that can be achieved by that bulb is proportional to the voltage that we apply to the tube. And what happens is electrons are burned off of a cathode and they hit an anode and when those electrons hit that anode at high velocity those collisions make the x-rays okay so the x-rays come out of that collision so if I have a cathode and an anode and I crank up the voltage the speed of the electrons flying from the cathode to the anode goes up and therefore the energy of x-rays I can create also goes up as I crank up that voltage and so when you look at the relative number of x-rays at a specific energy, and we'll, these are kiloelectron volts, and that is basically the voltage you apply to the tube. That gives you how many, so if I apply 100 kilovolts, I get 100 kiloelectron volts for one electron hitting the target. So the highest energy x-ray I can achieve if I set my voltage to 100 um, is this, 100 k. Uh, kilovolts. It's this. So I have a few high energy electrons here and then I have a whole spectrum of lower energy electrons that come out and this is the relative number of those electrons that are in my beam. Electrons, or I'm sorry, photons that have, uh, x-ray photons that have energy down here are more readily absorbed by the body. Okay, so there's a higher amount of absorption of these photons than there are of these photons. So as you proceed through the patient, you, you absorb more low energy photons and fewer high energy photons, relatively speaking. And so the beam, as it's moving through the patient, actually, it's called, it gets harder. The energy of the beam gets higher as you move through. And so that gives you a slight... Um, difference in absorption as a function of depth that you have to, if you're doing really precise reconstruction, you have to take care of that. Normally what's done is you just ignore the fact that you have this continuous energy spectrum of x-rays and you estimate your electron beam with a simple mean energy, average energy of that beam. And uh, so the, the actual amount, number of photons that you would detect at your detector would be proportional to the integral through the patient with the mu value at each position in that patient weighted, weighting your integral. And that mu value is also proportional to energy, which makes things a little complicated, right? So if it's a 100 keV photon, it's going to be uh, 
attenuated at a different rate than a 40 keV photon. But essentially, we just set the energy to the average energy and, and evaluate the mu as the average uh, at the average energy of that beam. And it's a relatively reasonable approximation. Uh, it, it, it results in some artifacts, especially for objects that have um, a high degree of attenuation. So if you have bone in your field of view, if you have metal in your field of view, like hip implants or something like that, then you'll get artifacts from, uh, from basically a, a vast reduction in, energy, in numbers of low energy photons. Okay, so we assume we've got an average energy. So this thing here, the density of photons as a function of energy times energy just becomes our intensity, our basic intensity. It's a single scalar number. Uh, and we take the log of, of, well, we divide and take the log to get our projections. Okay. Any questions about that? So how do we solve for um, mu xy? So let's say I have a very simple image, and it's a 2 by 2 image. And I'm going to take these projections of uh, x-ray absorption data through this object. So I can shoot x-rays in parallel this way and shoot them in parallel this way. Right, um, and I will get my p-value, that projection function, you know, for each one of those rays. So the underlying mu value in this box is mu one, mu two, mu three, mu four, and that's my image. That's the thing I'm trying to reconstruct. I'm trying to extract that out from the measured values, which are my relative intensities from these projections, right? The integral in this case is simply a sum because I've got discrete boxes here and so that integration to get my projection turns out to be just these sums, right? So my projection here is the sum of mu1 plus mu2, the projection here is mu3 plus mu4, etc. Okay, so you can write down that if now we've discretized the problem we write it down as this set of equations. So I can write down that set of equations as a simple matrix formulation where I have all of the mu's in my field of view and the coefficients here that give me the value of the projection right at this point. So P1 is mu1 plus mu2, 0, 0, etc. So this matrix essentially describes the experiment that we've done to project, to, to have these projections. So here we've got four equations and four unknowns. And so you should be able to solve it uh, uniquely for the different values of mu. So we should be able to just invert it and get our, our image. Right? Um, turns out that these equations are not linearly independent. So the, the two projections we took here aren't sufficient because you can derive uh, one of these equations from the others um, right here. So we need a different projection. And that projection is along this direction. Oh, sorry, that's here. We'll get P5, right, where we have mu1 plus mu4 equals P5. So this is our third projection giving us this equation. And now we have a full rank matrix and we can solve for the mu's. So it took three projections to get this. So you can see where this is going. I mean, if I have a 64 by 64 image, I mean, I can just do the same, same thing. I can just write down my, the mu values here for each projection, and I just get a bigger and bigger matrix. Right? If 64 by 64 image, I would have 64 elements along here. I'd have 64 times 64 mu values here, because I've got 64 columns and 64 rows, right? But in modern CT, we're talking about 
resolutions of 512 by 512. So that means I need 512 times 512 individual estimates of mu, which is a lot. It's like 260,000 estimates, right, of mu. And so that gives me a 260,000 by 260,000 matrix. So the resolution of CT is outstripping our ability to do this linear algebraic inversion, right? And it turns out this inversion, if you have a matrix that large and it's quite sparse, is the inversion of that matrix is quite susceptible to noise. And so uh, this is not a noise-free measurement. There is uncertain, in each one of these p-values, there is sort of a random fluctuation from the actual underlying true value. Right? And so when you have that random fluctuation, then the, the inversion gets even more difficult and it gets more sensitive. So this is usually not done, this, this way of reconstructing images. However, in principle, you can see that given enough views, you could generate a matrix and enough equations to solve for anything uniquely. Right? That's, that's the principle that this explanation is describing. Uh, we're not going to talk about iterative. Let's just go straight to back projection. So the way we can make an estimate of the object much more cheaply than doing this huge inversion of that matrix is uh, a technique called back projection. And this is the original way CT uh, images were created. So let's set up the problem here. I have a underlying true image, which is three by three, and there's a three in the middle and zero in the background. That's a very simple object for one point. If I project x-rays through, I get zero, three, zero on this projection. I get three on this projection, zero, three, zero, etc. So to reconstruct this, all I have is the sum of these values here. Right? I don't know from this projection where this signal power comes from along this line. All I know is it's somewhere along this line. Right? So what we could do is take the signal power from these projections and just divide it up and project it back entirely back along the whole line. We don't have any information about where it is along that line, but we do know that it came from somewhere in there. So let's just, you know, if we want a three by three image, we'll divide this by three and project it back over the whole thing. So when I do that projection, I get zero, ones, and zero. And that object is consistent with this projection. Right? In the same way, uh, we can project on the diagonal, right, we can project back along that diagonal a 1, a 1, and a 1, and then zeros elsewhere. And when I do that, 1, 1, 1, I wind up with a 2 here, and 1's in the corners, right? So now here's my, my next partial image reconstruction is, is this one. And now from the projection that's vertical, I'm going to project back a 0, 3, and 0. So I'll put 1s in this column. So I have a 1, a 1, a 1. When I add the 1 to that 2, I get a 3. Right? And so now I have this object. And then I'll do this projection. You can see where this is going. Project that back. I get a 1, a 1, and a 4. So this thing, it's not a bad representation of this thing. right? It's pretty good. And it's super cheap to make that. Right? You can do this on a graphics card before you can blink, right? That, that's going to be done. Right? So it's a really efficient and cheap way to make the picture. It's called back projection. <clears throat> if I have a continuous object, and here's a projection from one view, another view, another view, uh, and I have a simple object in the field of view, let's say it's a circle right here, uh, then th these projections, three of them, will look like this. Right? So you get a relatively good estimate of where that simple object is. 
right? If, if everything else is clear, but you get these signals out here which are not true, all right? So those you could consider artifacts, this, this stuff out here. If you take enough views so that these get packed closer and closer together, these projections, you wind up with a picture that looks like this. And if this is a disk, it just looks like a blurry disk, right? So it has a, a peak and then it drops away at the edges of the disk. And this drop off as we move away, as, as you get more and more of these projections, that drop off becomes a one over R function away from an edge or a point. Right? And um, so it's a reasonable estimate of the image, but it has resolution problems right? because it, it has this blur associated with, with uh, the object. And you can see why, because you've got all this signal around the object here that you're mapping to the wrong place. I mean, that's, that's just not supposed to be there. If you look at, uh, say, a complex object like this that is a set of these circular disks, um, and what we're going to do is we're going to plot as a function of theta, which is our view angle, right, and a function of L, which is our position along the detector, remember, uh, we'll plot those G L theta values. So this function here is G L theta. So if I got, now let's go back to this. All right, these projections through here, this is L, right? And for each theta, we get one of these 1D functions. So if I stack those 1D functions on top of each other, so each row along here is a single 1D function that we get for a specific value of theta. So I click through values of theta and plot, you know, g is a function of l for each one, and that gives me my 2D function. Okay. That is called a sinogram, right? And we'll we'll discuss why it's called a sinogram in a, in a minute, but. Uh, Essentially, it's an equivalent, if you get enough estimates, get enough theta values, and your L is uh, pretty high resolution, this set of numbers is equivalent to this set of numbers in terms of the information contained, right? So we should be able to take this set of numbers and figure out this set of numbers. In a noiseless case, you can do it exactly. You can take this set of numbers, invert it, to get this set of numbers precisely, right? If there's no noise, right? And um, that was proven some time ago, called the projection slice theorem, and the um, through convolution back projection. And uh, so essentially, the, the information here is enough to to uh, to get these numbers back. Which is, it's kind of interesting, right? I mean, you know, when you think about these parallel lines through there and you're integrating all of the values along this line, you're piling up all that signal into an integral and putting it on a detector, right? So it, it's interesting that you, in this process, uncover like what the contents of that integral are, right, along the line of the integral. Obviously, you need enough angles, right, and enough views to, to do the inversion. <clears throat> one back projection of, say, one of these functions along here, right? Let's, we'll just back project it just the way we did in that very simple toy example. So we back project our absorption back into the field of view. It looks something like that. If we do, say, 256 of those, we get this function, which is called the laminogram, right? It's just all of these added up. So for every value of theta, we just bump, 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 just keep adding them up, and we get this, this function, which is, again, a reasonable estimate 
of the underlying picture, but it isn't the true object, right? There's problems here. There's this haze and there's a DC offset value here, which isn't true. And each one of these edges is blurred to a certain extent. You know that there's going to be a DC offset value, right? Because our G theta function, it's all positive values. We're projecting them back, right? And so as you just keep projecting, the whole, your whole image just keeps gaining power. Even the stuff in the background that has nothing in it, right? It just starts, it comes off the baseline and you have this signal out here, which is all of these rays that you've back projected. And so this is supposed to be zero out here. It's not going to be zero doing this, right? Um, so we need to modify this process in order to make one, make the background zero, so where you have an ob no object there, the projections that we're going to create cancel each other out such that you get back to zero. And also, we need to enhance these edges, right, because they're, they're getting blurred through this process. Um, there's a, I, I'm going to put a demo on the website uh, that is essentially the radon transform which is this thing. It's the radon transform is the transform from the, the sinogram or the object to the sinogram and back, right? And we'll, you, you can play around with the radon transform and get an, just a feel for how many projections you need to actually um, cr you know, accurately reconstruct an object. What happens if there's missing data uh, you could add noise to it and see what happens under noisy conditions. And I can run a bit of an example here. I think I have it open. Yeah. So this is the code. It's very it's trivial MATLAB code. Um, <clears throat> there'll be a coronary CTA raw data set, a Shep Logan phantom, which we'll look at right now, and then a data set that is just essentially delta functions, small squares at different places in the field of view so that you can see what a point object looks like when you, when you look at its raw data. Uh, so let's look at, we'll look at the Shep Logan phantom. We'll turn that on. This is contained actually in MATLAB. This is a 256 squared image that is just comes with MATLAB. Um, <clears throat> and what we'll do is we will reconstruct or we'll create a sinogram uh, from that, uh, that Shep Logan object using the radon transform in MATLAB. So these are the projections. So if I run this, let's kill this first. So this is the Shep Logan phantom. It's supposed to be a brain with you know, different elliptical objects in it. The reason these are ellipses is you can write down analytically what they are uh, and then solve analytically if you've got the truth. The projections of this object as a function of theta, right, along here, and this is the brightness you know, after the log has been done as a function of theta, and this is along the detector direction, okay? And uh, so as we click around in theta, we, we get these 1D functions, stack them up, and that's what the sinogram looks like for this object. Right? Uh, here we have done a projection every 1 degree for 180 degrees. And that's what this, this function looks like, which is probably enough to reconstruct a 256 squared image close to it because uh, we have 180 projections. We probably want a few more. So, and then if we take this object, right, which is a, you know, the, a reasonable sampling of GL theta, and we invert it using the radon transform, we get this back. So you can see it's pretty well the same picture. There's some streaks off these edges here, right, that are slight artifacts from taking this and going back to here. 
So what we can do is we can try and say, well, what happens if we say we want to use half the dose in this picture? So I'm going to take half the number of projections. Right? So I'm going to drop my dose by a factor of two, which is pretty significant. Right? So instead of doing that, we'll take a projection every two degrees right? and run that. The raw data now looks like this. Right? I've only got 90 samples. It's still pretty, it looks pretty decent, right? A decent representation of those. And the image that is achieved using that raw data looks like this. So now the, you can see in the background I have these artifacts. These are classic streak artifacts in CT. I have a streak, a very broad streak off this vertical edge here. And the, and there's a pattern of sort of streaks in, inside the object. But it still looks reasonable, right? So that's, I've only taken 90 views for a 256 squared image. So let's try, let's cut it in half again. So now I've cut the dose in half again. We're a factor of, you know, four down in dose. And uh, do that. So now I only have 45 estimates. They're separated by the delta theta between each projection is now four degrees. Right? Click, 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 click. So the function still basically looks the same, except it's got some issues here, some sampling issues. And then this is the picture that results. So these are classic undersampling streak artifacts. However, we don't really care about this stuff. This is air. You know, you, you, you know what's out there. So you still have a pretty good estimate of what's going on in here with a really low dose image, right? So it depends what you want to do with this image. If all you're trying to do is, say, center up what you're looking at, or you're just taking a real scout view or something like that, that image is just fine, right? If it's, if it's not something diagnostic. Let's go down by to eight degrees. So now we're down a, a lot, right? Another factor of two, so we're down by a factor of eight in dose, like an order of magnitude. And you can see the discrete views here of this, and then here's our object. Still not that bad, in my opinion, right? This is kind of crazy because you have all of these, you can actually see the individual projections of this, but it's still making an object that we've probably lost these this detail, but if we're looking for big stuff, we can still see the big stuff, right? So the resolution has gone down. Um, let's do 16 just for the hell of it. So here's our raw data now. We only have 16 views or less, 12. And now we're significantly you know, distorting the, the actual object and everything. But we've reduced our, our dose by factor 16, you know, it's not bad. So for certain applications, if you want to undersample, you can do it this way. The other way of undersampling would be to not take a full 180 degrees of projections, maybe take 90 degrees of projections and see what, what that looks like. So for certain views, that probably is fine. If you're, if you're trying to detect a, an edge at a certain orientation, that's probably OK. But. So in, in the homework, we'll do a few. I mean, you, you'll have this code, and you can play around with it. And we'll do a few examples of undersampling and signal to noise and things like that with CT. Any questions about that? Okay, and I will also put on uh, some raw data from an actual cornea angiogram with CT. Uh, these objects, here's another example of like just dots in the field of view of a certain pixel dimension. And you can see now why the raw data is called a sinogram when you look at the raw data for individual dots. They're essentially sine waves. Right? So if I have a dot right at the center, and I take a whole set of projections, 
right? And I stack it as a function of theta. So this is theta, right? And then this is my detector position, L. If it's right at the center, by definition, it's at my central detector point, right? So I'm rotating around and it's always gonna be in the center of the detector. And so that raw data will just look like a straight line right across here. If on the other hand, you know, I'm way out here, I'm at the edge of the detector for a specific view. If I'm looking down at the object, I'm at the edge of the detector. I'll have a, a, a point out here at this angle. And then as the detector rotates, it's a sine wave that has a higher amplitude. So the amplitude of that sine wave gives you the radial distance from the center, the amplitude of the sine wave. The phase of this sine wave gives you its position in theta around the origin. Okay, so if I had another object over here, 90 degrees away, it also would have a sine wave that looks like this. It would just be phase shifted. But the amplitude of the sine wave would be the same because they have the same radial distance. So your raw data is essentially a sum of these sine waves and each sine wave is generated by each individual pixel in the field of view. All right, that's why it's called a sinogram. So at any point in your raw data, say this point, it's the sum of all of those things put together, right? So at, at a specific point in your raw data, you have summations from many different um, uh, projections. Okay, so let's get a, another, a better feel for that. So we'll look at, I mean, this is the essence of CT, is understanding this, this sinogram. So here's a, an object which is a phantom that we put in the scanner to measure signal to noise and, and uh, signal uniformity and things like that. So this background stuff in the phantom would have the absorption of tissue, so it would be pretty well equivalent to water close to. This would be bone, it's really bright, and then air is back here, and these are filled with air, these holes here. So if you recall, the Hounsfield unit of air is minus 1,000. The Hounsfield unit for water was zero, right? In any scanner, they always calibrate the scanner such that that occurs. And then bone is a high Hounsfield unit, you know, sort of maybe up at 1,000. Right, or even more. So here we have zero, or I'm sorry, uh, minus a thousand, minus a thousand, maybe zero back here. You can see also there's very dim objects here. So the contrast to noise between this material in this circle and the background, they're very similar mu values. And so the, the pixel values are very similar. And so that's a low contrast detection test there. This is the table upon which this phantom is sitting, and that this is the same thing that the patient lies on. So you, you put the patient on this, this table. It doesn't attenuate many x-rays, but as you can see, it attenuates some, because you get a picture of the, of the table. This is the sinogram for this object. Okay? So first of all, let's ask, which direction in this two-dimensional two function is the theta direction? So which direction do we get one-dimensional functions such that we change theta and we get a new function? And it's pretty obvious from this one that, say, let's look at, say, one of these objects. One of these dark circles are obviously these two things here. And I get a sine wave going this way. So this is the theta direction, and then this is the detector direction. And we can also ask, okay, if this is the detector direction, we got that, and this is the theta direction, what angle is this, right? This thing has a maximum here and a maximum here. So what angle through the object would that be? Right? When I project that down, what's that going to be? And it obviously is either 
vertical going from top to bottom or vertical going from bottom to top because it's at its widest point. And obviously a projection that it's at its widest point would be along here, perpendicular to this, so going this way. So that's the horizontal projection. And then as we move theta, right, you can see this crap over here, it's asymmetric, right? So when I do the projection, I've got a whole bunch of junk here. I go through the object. It's obviously this way because it's got its minimum dimension here. And then there's free space here, nothing. So that's up here. This is the junk, right? And this is nothing. So we can kind of look at the, the sinogram, figure out what direction things are in. So let's ask, is this a vertical or a horizontal uh, projection? Are the x-rays going on a horizontal trajectory or are they going on a vertical trajectory? So it's thinnest. So we're projecting across here. So the x-rays must be coming this way or this way, we don't really know yet. Uh, and so it, the x-rays are in a horizontal trajectory at this extreme. <clears throat> and so one problem you know, is given a specific line, right, so, or projection through an object, where are you in the raw data? Just, to, just so that you understand you know, what the the uh, uh, sinogram or how to construct a sinogram. Okay. So we can look at this as our L direction. This is the maximum. So we'll say that's a projection down on this direction. And then another position that you can mark is where these two sign, uh, signals from this object and this object cross. And that means they are in line with each other in that projection angle, right? So it's a, in some projections, they'll be as far apart as they can be, say here. And then other projections, they'll actually be on top of each other. So it'll be here. And so it's another way of orienting yourself uh, through the projections. <clears throat> Okay, any questions about sinograms or projections in CT? So that's essentially what we're going to do through the, the heart, right? We've got um, you know, our raw data, as we saw in the slide at the beginning of, of, the, of the lecture, is just that brightness as a function of ro rotation around. And that's when you plot those for that central line, you get that sinogram. Okay, so let's go back to our laminogram, and we have this after we've back projected all of these, these functions. Right? So in order to um, properly do the back projection such that you can recover the exact object uh, in the noiseless case, uh, what we have to do is apply a filter to the data in Fourier space. And um, the reason this comes about is that if we have an object in space, so this is sitting in our scanner, and this is a projection through that object, when you when you sample the projection, it turns out that the Fourier transform of that projection right, is a sampling through the origin of the Fourier transform of the object. And so if we have our, our 2D object, we take a projection at a specific angle. When we take the Fourier transform of that projection, it is essentially a sample through array through the center of the Fourier transform of our 2D object. And so when we take multiple projections like that, we are, we're doing polar sampling of the Fourier components of the object. They, these samples are on rays around the origin. 
in order to accurately reconstruct that object from those samples in Fourier space, we need to do the Fourier transform in polar coordinates. And it turns out in polar coordinates, the Jacobian is r d theta r, right? r d theta dr. And so you need to apply this r function to the raw data to take the 2D Fourier transform uh, to bring it back to, to uh, actual space. And it's, it's that process uh, that from your projections, that weighting of that R in Fourier space gives you the appropriate weighting to reconstruct the true object. The reason we're getting that filtered object or the basically the blurry object is if you don't do this, you know, multiplication by R in Fourier space, you just you know, make it a flat top, you get a, a blurring of the object. You overweight the low frequencies of the object. And so this is called the ram lock filter. And um, you can apply it in Fourier space by just multiplying your, the Fourier data itself before doing the filter back projection. Or you can convolve your projections with the Fourier transform of this filter and then do back projection. Then do that integration, and it, and it will be the same thing. So in convolution back projection, we convolve our projections with this kernel, which is the Fourier transform of this appropriate uh, weighting in Fourier space. We convolve it with that, and then we back project those convolved reviews. So if we start, recall when we had a disk and a projection of the disk was a function that looked like this, right? So that's the g l theta for a specific theta it looks like this, where l is this direction. Uh, when we do the convolution with the Ramlock filter with that r filter, or the Fourier transform of that, we get this function. It's much different than this function, right? It's got a flat top. It's got negative side lobes. Zero is here. These are negative numbers down here, right? And so back projecting this is quite different than back projecting that. We are going to get a different object, right? In fact, we're going to get something that has a disk with a constant value. That's a good thing, because that's what our object was. Remember, it was a circle with a constant value as opposed to back projecting these in which you would just get like a dome with this shape, right? And these negative lobes for stuff that's outside the object in the background, as we back project all of these, these things, all of these negative lobes will eventually cancel out that signal on the out in the periphery. And so you get zero out there, right? And so that's the way you achieve uh, the actual accurate inversion of the object is doing convolution back projection. So just to review, you take your projection, you convolve it with the Fourier transform of this thing, right? Looks something like that. And then those are your new convolved uh, projections and you back project those, right? And it's, it's like doing an integration. So here's one, here's four, 64, 512 projections. Right? And you get zero in the background, and that blurring goes away on the edges. So let's go back to that example. Remember, if I go back a few slides, where we have this object, I'm sorry, this object, and these are our g theta values. right? If we convolve those with the Ramlock filter, or the Fourier transform of the Ramlock filter, here's the raw data. If we convolve those, we get this. All right, so it's this function. Everything was positive, remember? Now, if you look at this function, you've got a lot of negative stuff in here. And basically, excuse me, that negative stuff is used to cancel out the, the stuff in the background. 
So we back project these. And that looks something like this. Right? And then, so here's 40 out of back, you know, of those projections convolved with that Fourier transform of the Ramlock filter. 80, 120, and then at 240 we get the object back. Okay, so this is uh, essentially if you project, this one is using all of these projections to get this. This one is using all of these projections, that many projections to get that. So you can see the object sort of comes into, into focus. Uh, this is a demonstration of those projections creating the picture as you add more of them together. Right? So basically as you sum those things up, you get a more accurate representation of, of that, oops, sorry, of that object. And all of these processes can still be done very quickly on even an old computer, right? So convolutions, when I was a graduate student, we had actual um, specialized cards to do things like convolutions, right? And Fourier transforms and stuff like that. So those can be done just lickety-split, like in MATLAB and stuff, you can do them right now. So it's pretty cheap still to reconstruct it using this, where you convolve all your projections and then do the back projection. You can, you can do 512 by 512 image in tenth of a second or less, right? So you can just erase right through them. The, one of the issues with using a filter in Fourier space that is a hard, you know, ROM lock filter or just you know proportional to this, the magnitude of uh, K which is your your position in Fourier space is uh, the fact that you're really amplifying high frequencies in your data and aggressively attenuating low frequencies in your data and when you have a uh, filter, and those of you who've looked at linear systems at all, you, and you realize a filter that has this profile in Fourier space where it comes and just boom, shuts down to zero really quickly, it's going to generate some ringing and, and nasty artifacts, and also will amplify high frequency noise quite a lot. And so <clears throat> this was used early on, and then people started softening the edges of this filter to try and reduce the really high frequency noise and the, and the artifacts. And so you get a whole set of different filters where instead of the, just a pure one, uh, you know, magnitude of K, uh, you start seeing these rolling off these high frequencies in order to smooth the image. And right down to things where you, you know, you actually even the first derivative goes to zero and stuff like that. And so these are a hamming filter, a hanning filter. This is what the function that you convolve your projection with looks like when you use this filter. And this is what it looks like when you use this filter. So you lose some of these uh, edges and, and it kind of smooths out over space. So we, as an example, if you reconstruct a square uh, with this hard, with the raw data convolved with Fourier transform of this filter, uh, you see these, you know, artifacts coming off the edges. You get a fantastically sharp edge, though. Right? You get high frequencies in your image, so you get a really sharp edge. The line pairs per millimeter are maxed out in this one. Uh, if you want a softer, gentler look to your image with lower noise values, then you multiply your, or you convolve your raw data with Fourier transform of this thing, which is a much softer filter, and it, and it blurs the picture as well as uh, giving you the negative side lobes to get every, the, the um, signal correct. So this is a blurred version of, of the object uh, in which these hard edge artifacts are, are reduced. And so these are what those filters look like digitally um, 
you know, they're pretty simple uh, to implement. And again, these convolution kernels on any kind of graphics computer now can be you know, instantaneously uh, executed on the data. So if we have a projection, say we have a square object and its projection, you know, in one view looks like this, and we convolve it with Fourier transform of the discrete version of the ROM lock filter, so that's the really high frequency filter, the function that we're going to back project looks something like this. It looks like Batman. It's got these hard uh, edge uh, amplification uh, features. And then as we get softer and softer, uh, you know, those features reduce in amplitude with respect to the height of the object. So we'll take a look at a couple of artifacts that can occur in uh, CT. Uh, any, any questions thus far about projections or uh, the rom lock filter? Okay. We'll, we'll take a look at it on the problem set too so you can work through some examples. But So again, here's a projection. This looks like a projection of a disk. That same function here. Uh, when we convolve this function with that uh, convolution kernel, which is the realm lock kernel, we get this hard edge function here. If there are slight artifacts on here, amplification artifacts, because for example, this is our detector channel uh, direction here, and these three <coughs> detectors have, for whatever reason, just a slightly higher gain or they popped a little bit of noise on, on this projection. The, they can be quite small in terms of their percentage of the amplitude of the signal. But when you do the convolution, you're, you're essentially really amplifying sharp changes in this function. And so you get this as the function you're going to back project. Right? And now you can see that these objects because it's only in one view, let's say there's some, for some reason there's a spark or something and it causes noise in the one view, uh, that view when it's back projected will produce these three discrete lines through the object. And that's basically the spreading of all the signal that's under that through that line there. Right? And so those straight lines are just a bad channel in one view. You get that an artifact of, of a nice straight line through the object. If I have a set of channels, one of those, let's say one of those little chiclet cards of the, uh, remember we looked at the detector, if one of those things went out or its preamp went sagged or something, for whatever reason in a simple view, then you would get a projection after convolution that looks something like this, and you would get a big swath uh, through your object. So you can see why we have to normalize our data very carefully. When we looked at the sensitivity of the detector array and it was very highly variable as a function of position, if we just back project that data, all hell will break loose, right? Because we'll have tons of these erroneous um, projections coming through. And then after convolution, they get, they get really big. And so you get a really messy picture. So you really need to make this data as clean as possible before doing the projection. Uh, if I have this is my projection and I have a bad channel but it's just 1% error on this on this channel so it's a really tiny tiny difference in that one channel but it's consistent for all of the views right? so that channels giving me slightly different gain for all of those views and this is what it looks like in each individual projection then what you get is an image that has a ring in it, right? Because this, it, it looks like there's this object here that's a ring because it's always hitting that same detector, right? And so this is a common artifact you see actually in CT images, specifically early CT images, are a set of rings as you come out from, from the center uh, because of this, right? Um, so I, I think in the problem set we'll probably look at 
using the radon transform, and we'll take a look at some examples and projections and stuff like that. So let's see what we have here. I think we're going to look at resolution again. Um, recall that uh, if I want to make a function that is a, a square wave, right, with really sharp edges, I need to add up sine waves of progressively higher frequencies with different amplitudes. And this is just Fourier composition of a signal. Right? Uh, as I add in these harmonics, I have a primary harmonic, you know, the secondary third, etc. I get closer and closer to my target of a, a way a square wave that has sort of an infinite you know, a vertical slope here. So this is using three Fourier components. I can create this function. If I go to more, I can I can create uh, a high frequency function with these really hard corners. So a, a way to look at the spatial resolution of a system is how does your system attenuate frequencies as you get to higher and higher frequencies? Does your system allow you to create these uh, frequencies. And that's called the frequency response of your system or the modulation transfer function. Remember we looked at the line pairs per millimeter in that phantom that had the, an array of, uh, of line pairs around the, along one radius. And the question is, how does your system attenuate the amplitude between the peak and the trough of a sine wave for each frequency. And as we get to higher frequencies, we see that our system will attenuate this contrast between the peak and the trough as we go to higher and higher frequencies until finally we're down to a point where we really can't resolve the fact that it's a sine wave anymore. It's just, the, it's just sort of an average signal. And we don't see uh, sinusoidal oscillation. That is called the modulation transfer function of the system. Spatial frequency in cycles per millimeter. This is review. Um, and our relative amplitude of that attenuation gives us that, that function. And so that's how we calculate uh, spatial frequency in CT. And normally we do it with a phantom that um, has either line pairs and we just measure the contrast if it's in the problem set, or we put um, into the scanner a very small object, as we saw in the exam, like a, a dot, which can be like a little bead of metal that has high attenuation, but it's smaller than a voxel. And we image it and we get, uh, you know, a depending on the system, this is a high high resolution system, medium, a system that has lower resolution. And we look at this point spread function of that object. The Fourier transform of that point spread function, in this case, line spread function, is the modulation transfer function of the system. Okay. So that was just review. I just wanted to make sure everybody uh, knew that. Most of you got that on the, on the exam, which was, which was good. OK, so we're going to stop there. Um, any questions about CT principles? Next next week, we there there might be a change in the schedule next week uh, because my my wife might have a baby next Wednesday. <laughs> that's how, that's how it's scheduled. Uh, but so Francisco Kondajak might come in and do the principles of MR next week. We'll see how it goes. Um, uh, otherwise, we'll get a problem set up. Uh, this evening uh, for for the CT principles, like the physical principles stuff, and then we may do CT applications next week or or uh, MR principles next week, and then we'll also Ashish and I after this we'll get together and figure out a schedule for the presentation of the papers. Uh, thank you very much for uh, bringing in the, the titles that you want to look. It looks like a good selection. Oh yeah, your midterms also are here, uh, so you can pick those up. <laughs>